Oof, where are my tums? <laughs> It's a combination of your butter bars, the Fritos, the brun- the, the uh, brunch treats. The brunch brunch. Right. Oh, this goes with... Well, the pizza will be here in a while. That's, That's right. Exciting. Hey, everybody. It's We're recording this on a Pizza Friday, so this is a show before pizza, because if we do the show after the pizza, we'd take a dive. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll... I'm sure we'll yeah. Yeah. It's cucumbers. No, no, no. You can't put a cucumber on a pizza. Well, why not? I like cucumbers. That's a, not a pizza. It'll taste a terrible. Yeah, but that's the idea. You make your own pie. Yes, but we cannot give the people the right to choose any topping they want. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> hey, everybody. Mike Rosso here. Film photography podcast here uh, in FPPHQ in Fairlawn, New Jersey. And I'm very thrilled to have Leslie Lazenby. Hello, pod people. Mark O'Brien. Howdy. Mark Dalzell. Hello. And Mr. Matt Marash. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, we're going to dive right into... Uh... Mail's in. Can we open up with a letter? We can, but I don't have any. <laughs> There's been like a piece of paper between Mark, <laughs> Dalzell, and Leslie going back for it. I go to grab it. I know. No. It's just your scrap paper that you print these out on. It's, the, it's an old script, and it's awesome. I just want to act out the script with... With Leslie. Well, or with anybody. I think they're all male you roles. Copy? I don't, there's but... Three, there's three characters plus a narrator. Okay, Ooh. go ahead. But... All right, this here's a, not quite a letter. Well, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I need two other people and a narrator. Oh, well, can we make two copies really quick? Can all, can all it's kind of cute the way the subject the matter. Read. The subject matter. Mm-hmm. It just... He always, like, he looked through all the letters. The back yeah, most it's of always a script. script. And I always uh-huh. read the script. I'm like, well, what the hell was this? And most of scripts of movies that never got made. I wonder why. What movie is this? <laughs> <laughs> well, how would we know? We only uh, get one page. Five punches Will in the gut. Yeah. <gasps> the sequel. <laughs> Presenting a scene from an unknown motion picture as executed by Mark Dalzell and company. Wait, I'll, I'll be Clyde, I guess. There's Clyde, Will, and Garrett. It could be Will, and then Mark. Oh, no, I don't want to be one. Will. Oh, but how many characters are there? I'll be Garrett. I said three. I'll oh. be Garrett. You can be the narrator. I'm nobody. I'm Garrett. You're the narrator. Matt's the narrator. All right, great. I'm loading my my roll film back. <laughs> Ready? Yes. Yeah, I'm Garrett. That's better, but still too late. Clyde punches Will in the gut as he staggers, expelling breath, and tries to stay standing. <laughs> Besides, these two tea bags were picking on your kid at school. We're doing you a favor. Will looks at them, and the two bullies try to look innocent to little avail. It doesn't matter. Just let them go. Tell us where you hid the film, and we'll think about it. Clyde punches him. We've done look there, and a couple other places. Garrett looks panicky. Tell him, mister. It's the truth. Clyde and Lang look at each other. If that's true, and we missed it, maybe the kid brought it. Will is panting hard, but suddenly alert. Corey! Clyde gives him a narrow, evil glance. And scene. To be continued. <laughs> That's a scene from... I've been wanting to do that <laughs> for months. That's a scene from the as-yet-unreleased Real Monsters, which you did music for. Uh, did I? Well, now yeah. I've acted in it. The dad... We all are gonna get That credits. was all of our audition. That kid's dad has a, a, a 50-foot... F- Super 8 film reel that he shot back in the 80s of some land, local land where there was a chemical dumping. Oh. And that company that now runs that land wants that film because that's evidence mm. of okay. toxic dump. And it just so, so it's a cross between eight, what is it, Super, Super 8, 8 and Aaron Brockovich. Yeah, it's, and it just so happens it's that there's a, a Sasquatch also hanging out. <laughs> For real. Oh, by the way, aliens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That That'll great. be Fidelity's role. <laughs> I, li- I like that the film tied it yep. kind of tied it neatly in. Yes, I like that. Yeah, it has the word. Film when they said it. that, we need to do this. Where's the, the film? Where's the film? And now Kodak presents a holiday reminder from Betty White. This week we'll celebrate the Fourth of July. A good day to make the wonderful world of color yours with color snapshots, and you can do it so easily with your own camera, the one you have right now, and Kodak Color Film. Kodakolor film comes in all the popular sizes, and believe me, next to the pickles, it's the most important part of the picnic. So when you're out for holiday fun, be sure to take along an extra roll or two of Kodakolor film. 
so you can capture all the fun and color of your happy family day. With Kodakolor film, you can take color snapshots as easily as black and white. Just aim and snap, and you get beautiful, sparkling color prints. So no matter how you spend your day, save the fun in color. It makes a world of difference. Be ready before the 4th with Kodakolor film in the familiar yellow box. Remember, you can depend on the name Kodak. Hey, we're back. <laughs> So our first topic, let's start with Mr. Matt Marash. Hey, whoa. Shooting E6 and C41, handling difficult scenes. What yeah. do you mean? Well, the, the popularity and kind of the, resur- the, the more popular resurgence of E6 films, uh, you know, heralded in by Ektachrome coming in late last fall. Um, more people are shooting it, which is great to see. People are, are sparking you know, new interest in different reversal films, trying out old stocks, discontinued stocks, and some of the fresh ones. A lot of folks need to be reminded there's different means of shooting the different types of film. Your E6, of course, is a positive film, but it has a li- typically a little bit more limited dynamic range. How much highlight to shadow information you can fit on that E6 roll. It's typically a little bit less forgiving on exposure than your color negative films. And depending on who you're having scan it or how you're, you yourself are scanning it, might have a trickier time pulling out all that beautiful detail you might see by just holding it up to a light box. I, I myself went through this when I was uh, when I was touring through uh, parts of Africa with my buddy Tariq. I brought some uh, Fujifilm Velvia, courtesy of our friends at Fujifilm. It was different, and it reminded me I had to be kind of a uh, on alert. You, if you shoot negative film for too long, you kind of go on autopilot, Mike. It's uh, it's easy to get used to it. Put it in that way. Thank you, man. Yellow yeah, out. Just the do best. it. Go this way. Yeah, black black facing toward the dark slide. Shiny side out. Just take the take up spool out. Thanks, you're a pal. Yeah. Can we get it? No, no, I need to do this. this is Mike's got the film sweat. So Mike is uh, uh, he's diffusing a bomb. He's working pretty decently with the Calumet back. I just thought this would be a good topic. Oh, uh, and we'll pass it around the room. You know, your, your experiences. Do you shoot E6 and C41 at the same time? Do you treat them differently? Do you do any sort of pre-exposure or any, any different sort of handling of that? Uh, we'll open up the floor. I shoot E6 like digital. You okay. Can't, you blow the highlights out. You can't get them back by burning in or scanning your negative for the highlights. So that's how I think of it modernly. You, like I said, you burn a highlight out. There's nothing there but white. So that's how I differentiate between uh, E6 or slide film in general from C41 or a negative film. You know, it's interesting. I think I had this conversation with, with Phil from the Darkroom la- last summer when we had the the meetup. Those films were, you know, back in the day when people were doing their final output on slide, it was far more common to apply push and pull to the slide media than it was to do to color negative. But mm-hmm. now what we hear is people using color negative for push and pull like your portrait 400 and just kind of like pushing those crazy high numbers uh how i personally handle c41 versus c6 if you're shooting a stock where they're relatively close so let's say for example you have a 100 speed film like uh, like velvia or provia and you have like a portrait like a 160 or something uh i found the easiest way to work for it meticulously meter out your scene your your slide film only has depending on what it is four and a half five stops that's from shadow to highlight. So if you have some really crazy backlit scenes, so that sun's coming in heavy from behind, slide, it might not look the way the way your eyes seeing it or your your mind's perceiving the shot. Negative <clears throat> film might be able to recover it, but slide film, that stuff might not be there. Uh, I found metering it for the slide film and then just letting it ride for the color negative exposure was a great way to go because color negative can handle way way more overexposure and a right. little bit under. Anybody? Bueller? No, but everyone's fading. Time to wake this show up. <laughs> I, you, you pretty well covered it. Yeah. So part of it is getting to know the film stock you're using with and, and knowing the nuances of its exposure because they don't all react the same. Again, you can overexpose color negative film and really still get a lot out of it. One thing I, I realized I'd gotten super lazy about with color negative film, it was, color, portrait was my crutch. I could just put portrait in and not worry about it. One thing I'd for, almost completely forgotten is we still have to worry about color balance, folks. Hmm. Different light sources I, right now. 
We have we have some pretty strong hot lights in here, so some tung more tungsten balanced lights. There's some fluorescent in here, and there's you know a few things that look to be daylight balance. That's some mixed lighting. If we throw some portrait in there, we might be able to color correct it with some wonky stuff. But slide film, good luck. You're not going to have much fun with that. So color correction filters, you might want to look into some of those if you find yourself shooting in mixed lighting. So correction filters like FLD, uh huh, ADB. 80, I was going to say 82, 80, that's 81C. a cool one. 81C is a warming, not mm -hmm. a correcting. And the 85 series. 80, yeah. Yeah. So 85s, 80s, and FLD, FLB. And you don't have to pay for those filters. Most of the time they're going to come for free with <laughs> any old film kit, but they're that's what those are used for, correcting for those different light sources. Mm -hmm. Some of them will have a compensation amount, a half stop, something like that, but... Um, those those really come in handy with slide. Even if you're shooting all day long from sunrise to sunset, you're going to have a slightly different balance to that color as the sun goes through the sky, peaks through clouds, or it's a bright sunny day. For the folks that have a camera that can allow for double exposure on there, like that Calumet back you got in your camera right now, Mike, there's one other extra thing you can do if you want to improve how much stuff you can fit onto a uh, slide film. And this, this technique is very similar to pre-flashing in the darkroom. Has anybody here tried it? You can take a piece, a diffuser, usually something like opal glass. I have a pane of opal glass I put in front of my lens. If I know that I want detail in shadows in a very backlit scene or something with a really contrasty range that usually only negative film can do, you can meter out your scene and do... Some folks call it a zone zero, or you can just call it a pre-flash exposure. An exposure amount underneath what your shadow detail needs with this diffused glass, and it will give you just enough that it bumps up all of your shadows and your lower mid-tones and has no effect on your highlights, and you can squeeze a little bit more range onto that film. Um, it's a cool little technique. I think I've talked about this I, before. I think the, that really um, applies a little bit more to, to a large format than others because sometimes it's hard to get fully registered double exposure type thing. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. It, well, I mean, older roll film cameras, you can kind of get it, but it's yeah, mm -hmm. it's more of a large format thing. But if you're shooting with slides, slide film is often a little bit more expensive. Yes, it is. So take that time, bring that meter, maybe not the pocket light meter app, but just something to measure out your light. And uh, oftentimes the scenes you might like might have a little bit more range in there, so you might have to make a compromise. Thank you, Matt. Up next... <laughs> Take it away, Mark O'Brien. Okay. If you're familiar with Lens Baby, um, you know they've been around for quite a while, and they, they've always embraced this idea of soft focus or squiggly focus. If you had the original Squ Lens Babies, which had yes. the little little plastic tube that you can move everywhere, that's my that was my first contact with Lens Baby. Tilt shifty sort of thing. Back in the uh, yeah tilt shifty kind of thing. Back in about oh, ten years ago. But since then, they've expanded their line oh, to have goodness. all amazing diverse array of lenses and optics and so forth primarily i would say a lot for digital shooters because of the the focal lengths but all of their lenses could be used unless there's some special amount to them can be used on film cameras and i believe that um with the soft focus abilities of some of these lenses your optimal results actually are on on film. I saw the lens maybe 56 a while ago when it, when it first came out, and I, I thought, oh, I'd really like one of those, but I really wasn't wanting to pay 500 bucks for it. That's what that is. Lens baby velvet 56. Yep, that's what it's called. Lens baby velvet 56. 56. I've never seen anything like okay. it before. Okay, I'll try to bring the uh, in a, a, a few future times. podcast. I'll bring the SEMA version. Okay, because it's pretty interesting. Okay. And so this is a. This is a manual lens. Maximum aperture is f1.6. Minimum aperture is what, f22, I believe. 16. 16? Okay. Um, it's a very, it's a multi-bladed aperture. It's a beautiful lens. Um, it has a 62 millimeter front filter ring. As I said, it's totally manual. And that means when you're viewing it, let's say an aperture priority, um, the lens is stopping down as you're making the aperture smaller. So it's not an open aperture metering type of lens. If you use it on your digital camera, you'll have to use it in manual mode or depending on the on the camera system you use it with in the model, aperture priority or manual mode. So I have it on my Nikon FA here. Um, I shot with it a lot up in, in Pittsburgh on my uh, Nikon FM. This is a fun lens to shoot with. 
wide open and you've got specular highlights, you get some amazing bokeh, 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 bokeh. When it's wide open, yes, it can be very, very soft. But as you um, stop down past F5.6, I think it gives you some really nice results. So I, I missed that at the beginning. What is it? You, you keep it, saying soft focus, but what? Okay, it's, it's only the, the wider your aperture, the more out of focus things will be because you're, obviously your depth of field is smaller. But even then, the way it's, this lens is constructed, I was shooting things at f5.6. Um, so it's so, a soft focus. It's a lens that specifically does soft focus. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it the specific out of focus. soft focus. It can be out of focus. <laughs> um, well, I got but, hundreds of cameras that'll do that. But I was shooting, <laughs> I was shooting some buildings in um, in Pittsburgh, and so the center of the image, which was what I was aiming for, was was really well in focus, and the edges were soft. Yeah. And so it was a lot like an old, a much older lens. Um, but I really like it a lot. I mean, it's it. If you could use this for portraits and really um, have some nice soft images. But again, if you're shooting wide open on digital, I don't think you get the uh, as good a result as you get on film uh, with this lens. It also focuses down to five inches away, so it'll do up mm. to one half life size. Um, so it's, it can be used as a macro lens as well. How much for the lens? So four hundred bucks. <laughs> Considering that, wait, what? Four hundred bucks. <laughs> oh my god! Considering the first okay, one was like thirty-nine. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's what I was thinking you were going to say it's, like hundred. It's got a huge throw for focusing, and there's no, there's the lenses have very, um, they they're, they do have click stops, but they're very soft. So I suspect you could use this for video too, and have some really have a lot of fun with it. Mm -hmm. It's it's not plasticky. There's no plastic in it. Can I'm guessing you can get a Canon FD mount? No. Oh, but no. I'm Oh, what? Yeah. Yeah. what? You can get EF. Oh, you can get EF? You can get EF. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's meant for the, the did shooter. But the yeah. EF would be all manual. Yeah, all it's all manual. manual. All manual, yes. There may be other mounts, but with Canon and Nikon, we, uh, there may be a Pentax mount for it, too. I'm not There's sure. There's a Sony E-mount version of it and a Fuji X mount. Okay. So can you... This is mounted on your Nikon FA. Yeah. Can you put your camera into aperture priority and that's what I got it in now, yeah. And as you dial it up or down, you yeah, could because there's no it's the the aperture closes as you dial it up or down. It's not like um, an open aperture camera, open aperture metering. Oh, look at that! So getting do like so you darker. See, you see your depth of field. Do you see yourself just selling it off? Or? No, no, no. I'm <laughs> well, keeping. You always it. ask that. <laughs> nice, Mike. No, I'm 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 keeping this baby for as long as I can. Okay. I've got and I my only other lens baby lens was the original, very original one, and I still have it ten years after I bought it. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. You're welcome. What's that? Uh, oh, the doctor just came in. Yeah, the doctor's in. Hi, doc. Sure Thank you. Oh, is this a letter? <laughs> this is a, this is a this is a, the doctor's in segment that someone sent me. Oh, very Hi, good. Hi, doc. Oh. They, Take it away, they, doc. They do that. I'm a newbie. Sorry for the stupid question. Oh. What is the difference between 35 millimeter film cameras and 135 film cameras? First and foremost, there are no stupid questions. Jeff Salisbury always said that. Professor Jeff. No stupid questions. Only the he, ones you don't ask. <laughs> so what's the difference between a 35 millimeter film camera and a 135 camera? To break it down, to break it down quickly, 35 millimeter is the physical size of the film, and 135 is the format name. 35 millimeter film goes into a 135 camera. We use both of these interchangeably. 35 millimeter film size is 35 millimeter by 24 millimeter if it's a full frame. Manufacturers many times use the physical size of the film mm -hmm. and then would modify it just a little bit as the nomenclature for the whole format size. This is what I think happened here. 35 millimeter, let's put a one in front of it. In that little theory, let's look at 126. Uh, 126 cartridge film was to be a 26 millimeter square image. So put the one in front of it, 126. It ended up being 28, but nobody changed it. 120 does not correspond to this. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Uh, it's not 120 millimeter 
film, nor is it 20 millimeter. What the and heck? put the one in front of it. It's actually 60 to 61 millimeters. Is that only mm-hmm. because the 120 is such an old film that Kodak back in the day was just throwing num- code numbers, 120, 122, 124 film? There's, there's it a, had nothing to do with the millimeter. There's right. a lot of that going on. It had nothing yeah. to do with the millimeter. Yeah, I wondered if 35 millimeter and 135 now, it was is just a coincidence. Typically a two by two inch, what they call two inch square. That's zero on the end, a one in the front, and Matt's got a Matt's got a. You know, it save us some some drama here, Doctor. Yeah. <laughs> if they just called it what it was, yes, miniature film. <laughs> oh, oh, miniature oh. and sub miniature. <laughs> sub 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 <laughs> miniature. Sub miniature. You think seventy um, millimeters is miniature? Well, now two twenty <laughs> kind of makes sense. It's twice as long. Yeah, that makes sense. It does, but the 20 still throws us off. Maybe it should have been 224. There should be 24. A, they should have made a 235 when you're shooting 36 rolls. Call yeah. I mean, 120 may have come from 12 exposures, and they just put a zero on the end. Now, of course, we know we don't always get 12 exposures. Sometimes six and eight and nine, that but type of thing. when they introduced that 120 film, they were basically six by nine images they were shooting in those box cameras. That's That's correct, yeah. yes. 828 is a pleasure. 828 is 28 millimeter by 40 millimeter for the physical size, and it only shot eight on the roll, eight and 28. That would make sense. The film, film had been around long enough by then that they yep. made some sense out of it. 620 mm-hmm. and APS, just forget it. Yeah. Well, no, 620 makes a little bit more sense because it is 120 film. The 620 film makes sense because they were, as Mark said, bigger negatives. Almost all 620 in its original form made six exposures. So you get 620 APS, which I would just like to erase from the minds of the photo public forever. Um, (laughs) Advanced photo system. You weren't a a dealer then. You didn't have to deal with this Hmm. forced down your throat APS photo system. Yeah, 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 exactly. So with 35 millimeter newbie, don't sweat it. You, if you Google 35 millimeter or 135, uh, it you're going to get what you need. Right on the box of film, even today, on the end of the box of 35 millimeter film, it says 135 dash 24 dash 36. So don't sweat it. That's the easy one. You're good to go. That's. But that's why we sometimes refer to it as, I have a 35mm camera. And you have a 135 camera that takes 35mm film in all technicality, but you're good to go. You know what this reminds me of, Mike? What's that? There was one, there was one day you called me because I, th- I think this, some of this was going on in, in the FPP Flickr group. Oh. You, I answered the phone. Like, hey, Mike, how's it going? He's like, trolls. They're not good. <laughs> I recognize this conversation. Internet- this is what he does to me, too. Yeah. It's it's a classic Mike Rosso call. You should experience it yourself. Uh, how's mm-hmm. that go? No, it's just like, hey, how's it going? Trolls, you know, they're <laughs> they're everywhere. Who cares? One thirty five, thirty five. It's it's all the same. Mm-hmm. It is. Just it's, don't say one hundred and twenty millimeter film. Yeah, that oh, kind of thing just kind of grinds us all a little bit. You grind your teeth and go. Oh, no. well, who cares? Yes. It, well, yeah. here's where you need to lose a little common sense. But people don't know. No. Well, it's. The film is basically 60 millimeters wide. People can't read. I know. 60, I can't. 60 plus 60 is yeah. 120. <laughs> it's starting to sound like a common core math problem. It does. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what did you tell us? Mike, Mike's guy. on a train. No, traveling. what I told him was, is, <laughs> don't worry millimeter. about it. I mean, you know the actual size of the film. And I told him, it's 35 millimeter film. The format name is 135, whichever you Google or order or look for or find a category at a store, you're going to – either one that you say, you're going to get the right film. The only time I've seen 135 used for the film, yeah. um, the folks that sell ADOX, the photo impact oh, yeah. site in Europe, in their search, you have to check the 135 box to see 35 uh, mil film. It's mm-hmm. interesting. But everyone – just you know, just shoot. Have fun. Just, but yeah. 16 millimeter and 8 millimeter, we're all set on that, right? Oh, yeah. And then there's Minox. Then there's this 70 millimeter, yeah, which yeah. is really 65 millimeter. Well, those all came much later. If yeah. you look at the original film, all the stuff from the teens and the 20s, you could get the 101 and the 102 and the 118 and the 122. Yeah. Like, there were so 124. many. And 122, 118 is bigger than 120, and 122 is bigger than all of them. And 616 and 116, kind those of the same, but slightly sort of different. Get, but yeah. yeah, 616 and 116 were like 120 and 620, right. basically. Yeah. Right, spool. 
Yes. There were so many core and yeah. thickness. So don't sweat it. Yeah. Once you kind of know. Yeah. I'm not well, sure that if you, you have to sweat if you it, just make sure you don't buy the wrong. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. But well, then it, buy it won't happen too much. for your Canon A1. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not seeing any super nasty people. No, in groups the, anymore. They, they go. They move to you know. They're sharks. They move to where the, there's like more newbies posting well, questions. Bait, yeah. 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 The film groups have been fairly. Fil- film shooters in general are, are a little more chill. Cranks. <laughs> the cranks. The cranks. <laughs> yeah. Although we all get cranky sometimes. We do. Get off my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> You got a camera over there? I got what? a camera. Yeah, I'll talk about a camera. What kind of camera okay. you got? I got, this is a, this is a uh-uh. funky little TLR. Oh. It's called the Kenflex. <laughs> like Barbie, bar- and, oh, Barbie and Ken, Ken? Uh, oh, hi, Ken. I didn't even think I should have brought a Barbie camera with me. Yes, a Barbie and a Kenflex. The Kenflex, if you're Googling along at home, doesn't <laughs> actually exist. So what Kenflex was... What am I is, looking at? This was an Americanized first flex. So if you if you look up first flex cameras, these all sound like bad gyms. I know. Well, they're Japanese. They're Americanized Japanese names. So. Did you eat that whole bag of chips? <laughs> Except for the handfuls that you swiped. Oh, he's getting up sex. We're taking too much. That was my breakfast. I brought with me. <laughs> what about lunch? You're Free. buying lunch. Okay. Free does for breakfast. When's, when's lunch getting here? Do you ever put cheese on those? And put them in the microwave. <laughs> Walk and taco. No, Fritos. What do you call it? Walk and taco. Yeah. But you know, you know, at uh, at Taco Bell, you can get the Frito burrito that's got Fritos in it. It's amazing. That's right. It's a beefy crunch burrito, and yes, it's loaded with flaming hot Fritos chips because I don't like playing it safe. I'm a wild man, but also responsible because it's just ninety nine cents. So why don't you turn around one more time? I dare you. Oh boy. Now what? I think you and I should go to Taco Bell one night. I almost stopped yesterday. I stopped at Wendy's instead. These were made in the early 50s by a, a, a small Japanese company called Tokiwa Seiki. And there's not too much information on the Kenflex, but from what I can deduce, the Kenflex was just designed for the American market. It's the exact same camera as the first Flex. It's a, a TLR. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say it's a faux TLR. It's nearly a totally respectable TLR camera. It uh, has an 80 millimeter. Oh, hold it up. <laughs> Cock it. Dark slide. Oh, my God. Have you been shooting that whole roll with dark slide in? No, no. I put the dark slide back. <laughs> well, okay. uh, did you remember to turn the mics on? Yes, I did. Good. Mine's up. Oh, mine's highest. It's a proper TLR, not a faux TLR. It's got an 80 millimeter, 3.5 taking and viewing lens. Ken lens or what? What's it called? It, it is a, No, it's actually a first. Oh, a first. And a stigmat because it's, the, it's, oh, a, right. it's a first, first, first flex. flex. So I guess they didn't bother going to the trouble to etch Ken mm-hmm. on the lenses as well. So it still has the first lenses on it. Nice that the viewing and taking lenses are the same. Yeah. But what you see is what you get on the first Flex Ken Flex. Does it uh, 120, 220? A lot uh, of them of that age did? No, 120. Only. 120 only because you've got the window. you got to count it. Oh, okay. Uh, so gotcha. You're just getting, it has a completely acceptable... This is an early 50s camera. So a completely early acceptable range of shutter speeds and apertures, which is... Mark! <laughs> which is a tenth of a second up to a two hundredth plus bulb uh, and the aperture range is 3.5 to 22 totally acceptable it's got a little bayonet mm-hmm. mount for a flash on the side um, there's no hot shoe or cold shoe or anything on it so you got to put it on a bracket I haven't actually shot with this camera yet I'll get to that in a second so I don't know I mean presumably this is not designed to be exsynced but it may work uh, I'll give it a test when I get around to trying it the feel is a little kind of chintzy and aluminum-y on it uh, it's a step up from a Kodak Duoflex or yeah. uh, the Argus 75 or one of those. Oh, yeah. But it's not quite at the level of the, you know, the auto cards or the Sheikas or anything like that. It looks like the Ryko, a lot like the Ryko um, ones that came out with the, with the geared lenses that way. Right, yeah. The Ryko, or I've actually got, the only one I have with the geared lenses like this is the uh, my Reseski. It's like the Lubitel. Yes. Oh, right. You know, yeah. that kind of Russian, the, the two lenses it are each other. Yeah, mine does not. I'm not. I don't get any difference in my viewing lens I think that it's seized up so I need to take these lenses apart before I actually shoot this camera and make sure that it's actually focusing on something so I'm a little worried about that right now I can see I mean even just focusing it, I can see the lenses aren't moving thing that I like about it which is pretty cool this is the only TLR that I have that, do, that does this it's very ergonomic to use so when you're actually using it to cock it if you're holding it in your hands like this like you would with a TLR cupping it with your two hands to cock it your left index finger lifts up no oh. And then to shoot it, your right thumb pulls down. It's very ergonomic. It's balanced, yeah. Yeah, it's really nice to use. 
Um, so I, I'll give them big credit for that. That's my favorite feature about it so far, just sort of fooling around with it in my hands. Yeah, it's like I said, it's it's sort of 50-50 halfway between a, a Kodak faux TLR and a cheap Japanese TLR. So there you go. Um, early 50s. How did you come across that one? This was one that walked into the store one day. Where did you get it? <laughs> You're going to be just cut right out. Oh man, the this power of editing! My store one day, so, you know, people come in with bags of cameras, and they'll pull out two or three little Canon digital cameras, and then one day they pulled it. I'm like, oh, yes, all right, you brought me something cool. Next question, Mark would be, how much did you pay for it? it? <laughs> how much did you pay for it? Yeah. I don't even. Probably five dollars. Did you shoot with it yet? No. Oh, uh, did you listen to them? The lenses, the lenses are out of whack on it. So oh, I, I got to fool fiddle with the lenses first, but. Um, I, I do like it. Um, they are not super common, but they are available on the, on the eBay. They sell for about 30, 30 40 bucks. Mm. Mine is in pretty good shape. This had was, <laughs> was. was. working condition, but now it has no working condition because I just dropped it. Do you think there was a leather piece on top that was popped yeah, off? I was just going to say that the leather they use is so cheap that you can see it's actually shrunk like a quarter of an inch all the way around. Wow. And the yeah. top piece of leather has fallen off. So I'll probably replace the top piece. The side ones I'll leave as a piece of carpet, maybe and or yeah, something. Is coming off. So I can I mean I've got so many old junk cameras and recycling bins. I'll find something. I'll find an old dead you yeah, shake I think a put a piece of carpet on it. it. Yeah, yeah. Some shag carpet. Yeah. Some orange shag on the top and look like a muppet. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. The Ken Flex, the Ken aka Flex. First Flex by I just want to say it again, Toika Siki. Here's some thoughts that came out of Mark O'Brien's head. <laughs> oh, that's scary. Such as no such thing as bad light. There's a few here. Film shooting is hard, film grain is bad. So, I'll I'll just start off with no such thing as bad light. Mm. Well, mm. If you're shooting film, or it doesn't really matter what you're shooting. I've seen some, like I think there are a lot of people shooting film, especially n- folks just picking up film who are not really acknowledging or using light to their advantage. In the last few years, my film photography just, just blows. <laughs> <laughs> I am not paying any attention. I'm not shooting at the right time of day. I'm just shooting. I'm just shooting snap. I'm. I've been shooting snapshots. I'm just putting flash on my camera, and I'm not utilizing light. And then I look at a shot like who's the guy up in Canada? Like Sandy. Oh, Sandy from Mister. Yeah. Yeah. I look at Sandy's work, and I'm like, you know, he just. And, and what he's doing is it's not like you know. It's not revolutionary, but it's amazing and beautiful. He's just bringing his model over to the window. Yeah. In a beautiful setting, at the right time of day, and he's capturing magic. So there's no such thing as bad light. For me, there's a lot of bad light. Pass along to Leslie. There's some light I certainly don't like to shoot under. Yeah. <laughs> but I got to tell you, you know, testing film, when I was testing all the black and white film, a lot of that was in the summer, and it's what I call hard light. Mm-hmm. Really contrasty bright light, and it's the best time to test things because you're going to see how it handles shadows and and uh, highlights on your film. Bad light. Yeah, yeah there's some <laughs> bad light out there. I I've, ru- I've run into some bad light. I think there's no bad light. There's just wrong film. Yes, because or, whenever, whenever there was well, bad light, what would Leslie tell me? Today's a perfect day for infrared. And you're right. You're right about the film thing. Certain films made for certain light that mm-hmm. gives you the. But I'm thinking about that hard light day. What shows up texture better when that light skims across something? What, raking light. So, yeah, raking lights. Yeah. That's an LPD 4 day for me. Super stark, high contrast. Used to be Panatomic X. We called those Panatomic X days mm. when it was really, really bright. Yeah. I, I think there's some difficult light. Make Makes you think a little different. I mm-hmm. think that that's. That's true. I mean, you go to a, you go out somewhere, and then the winter months have been particularly cloudy in, in Ann Arbor, and uh, you get into a rut, and you go, "Oh man, I really like to go shoot something, but I just can't get get up for it," you know. And but that's a time I think if you want to be a better photographer, is try to figure out how you can make something work for you under those conditions, and maybe that's a good time for close-ups or or things that where you get this subdued light i mean maybe go out early in the morning and you get that capture that soft light in the morning with landscapes or whatever but it does make it difficult if you have this preconceived idea what the light should be right and so typically 
you'll see newbies go out and they want they want a Kodachrome day, mm-hmm. you know, bright sunny light and all that, and uh, and that's fine for some things, but it's not great for everything. And the other thing is, is that sometimes you can use a different film. It's a good time to figure out what kind of what film works best in those conditions. Um, and I would say the only time you have really bad light is when it's too dark to shoot anything that you think is meaningful, but yet you can't use another light source without making it look like crap. So that that's another thing. So you have to figure out, and ex- don't don't be afraid to experiment. Go out and shoot some things, take some notes, and maybe you'll come away with some images you hadn't thought of that you had thought of getting at all. I think... Uh, uh, my, clip. Yeah, that's you have any right. opinion, Matt? No, I mean, they, they've kind of spelled it out this this is great because it goes hand in hand with that you know that c41 e6 topic we talked we touched on a yeah. little bit earlier it all plays in together you know uh practicing in these different lighting conditions forcing yourself to practice that's such a huge one there isn't bad light but man there sure are some days where it feels like everything's working against mm-hmm. you but force yourself to to make it work if you're stuck with that oh shoot I got 200 speed in my camera. What am I going to do? Maybe it's time to finally learn how to use that flash that's on there or use it off camera. So force yourself to work with it. Don't just eat the roll and say, eh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a lot to be said for purchasing a simple, if you're using an old timey AE1 or a Nikon. <laughs> I love that you're trying to use AE1 as an old timey camera. <laughs> well, that's no, what it is. I mean, not an, an EOS. Something that has a PC you could, on eBay for. N- Ten dollars, you can get a very long PC cord, and uh, yeah. the most amazing things have happened on film when I just simply put a little extra effort in to take that flash off the top of my right. camera and hold it over here, Bill Cunningham style. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm you know, too afraid to use flash. I never ever use electronic flash because I don't understand. You it. get so much more depth and it. character by just getting it off the top of the camera. I like to see That's what I'm going to get. That was a Doctor Zen segment. I almost wrote this time. Yeah. Um, so I'll go back that. and pull the question up maybe next time about oh, this flash seem to be confusing sometimes. So. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I just like to see what I'm going to get before it happens. Mm-hmm. For 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 me, digital's harder. Okay. For me, the thought of even using that s- silly little Loma Kino camera oh. and putting a movie ca- a movie together. I'm trying to convince oh. Leslie to give it a shot, and I'm just like, I okay, say, hey, I'll do the heavy I've, lifting. I've got three <laughs> scenes done. I need more than that, you know. That is, is to storyboard it, and not for me not to shoot something that's moving like stills. Two seconds, it's off. Two seconds, it's off. No, you got to let this thing run a little longer. That's really hard. Very, very, very hard for me. Bueller, you know, I, I threw that in there because I think you get people who are new to film and have been using digital, which is so easy when you think about it. If you've grown up with digital, um, if you're if you're using a a cell, a cell phone camera or whatever. Oh. It's so easy. It's always there. You just point it and snap it. And in general, you get pretty good results. And so they're con- when they're confronted with film, which they are not used to, and then they think, oh, this is really hard. But just like anything else, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Shooting film's like riding a bike. You just don't even think about it. Right. And, and you have to think. But even then... When you don't think about it is when you end up screwing something up. So you still have to think about it in the sense where ISO, what's my aperture, and things like that. But generally, the more you shoot it, you get more comfortable you get with a camera. And this is what I think some beginners make. They jump from one thing to the other to the other thing. They never get fully comfortable or confident with any piece of single piece of gear. And this also may apply to digital shooters as well that they never fully realize all the things you can get from that camera. And they think the next best thing will give me something better, but they never utilize all the features that camera has. So I think if I were to counsel uh, someone new to film, I'd say get a good camera that is something that you're planning on shooting with a a lot. Maybe it's an SLR, maybe it's a rangefinder, whatever. Use it a lot until you don't even have to hardly even think about the controls. Because when you're thinking about the controls, you're not thinking about your subject and all the stuff you want to shoot. Become one. Become one with the camera. Yes. And that's practice 
And Correct. that's yeah. also, mm-hmm. as we mentioned on previous shows, a lot of people are grabbing camera, shooting with them, dumping it, get another, like, like give your camera enough time, like, become one with your camera. Yeah. Film isn't hard, the discipline's hard. Right? Yes, it is. You never get better if you're not shooting. Get out there and shoot every day. Mark D. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, it's loaded with flaming hot Fritos chips because I don't like playing it safe. I'm a wild man. Get out there and shoot every day. I'm trying. When you bring in Ken out to shoot. Oh, hi, Ken. Bring Barbie and Ken. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us for this uh, show. What show? We'll be back in two weeks. Tweaks, tweaks. And, uh, you know, tune in to like filmphotographyproject.com. Go to the website, check out the latest blog, what's going on, the news, uh, sign up for our newsletter. I'll tell you, if you sign up for that newsletter, you get some, some product codes for some tasty deals. You know, like the amazing uh, Ectochrome deal. Mm-hmm. Buy one, get ten free? Yeah. Uh, That's send the way it works here at the table. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we're going to see you folks super soon. from Betty White. This week we'll celebrate the 4th of July. A good day to make the wonderful world of color yours with color snapshots. And you can do it so easily with your own camera, the one you have right now, and Coda Color Film. Coda Color Film comes in all the popular sizes. And believe me, next to the pickles, it's the most important part of the picnic. So when you're out for holiday fun, be sure to take along an extra roll or two of Coda Color Film so you can capture all the fun and color of your happy family day. With Coda Color Film, you can take color snapshots as easily as black and white. Just aim and snap, and you get beautiful, sparkling color prints. So no matter how you spend your day, save the fun in color. It makes a world of difference. Be ready before the 4th with Coda Color Film in the familiar yellow box. Remember, you can depend on the name Kodak.
buy a burger I like it really cheap The bread is almost plastic The patsy's barely meats Cheap burgers are the greatest uh, They really are a treat It shouldn't be organic It must be engineered in a factory a thousand miles from here and flown across the ocean above the troposphere yeah. cheap burgers 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 God, give me everything on top I'm getting deep uh, I need cheap burgers Cheap burgers, cheap burgers. 